Suffer Pod Show is produced and managed by podtalk.co.uk. I'm Mark Mason. And I'm Susanna Hornby. Episode 18, talking to Justin Sharp, founder and chef of Pea Porridge Bistro in Paris and Edmonds. Justin is one of Suffolk's top chefs, a champion of quality local food and wine production, and an advocate of the nose-to-tell dining experience. Here he is to tell all. And we would love to welcome Justin to the Suffolk Pod Show. Hello. Hello there, Suzanne. Good day to you. And I must say, what a, what a privilege it is to be part of the Suffolk Pod Show today. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me along. Well, that's nice. Thank you. It's lovely to have you. <laughs> what a privilege to be talking about your restaurant, quite frankly. It's one of Suffolk's most original and independent restaurants. We're yeah. looking forward to hearing so much about it. But Justin, could you tell us how you arrived here and with your wife, Jürgen? We arrived at Pea Porridge, well it wasn't Pea Porridge at the time, but we arrived in Bury St Edmunds some 12 years ago now. We we're, were actually trading in our 12th year. October 2009 was when we opened, but the journey to get us here was uh, probably you know, quite detailed, let's say. Um, <laughs> we met when we worked in London in restaurants there. We were very young, both of us, I must say, and she won't mind me saying it had far less grey hairs back then. <laughs> um, and, and uh, yeah, we uh, we sort of left London. You know, we got married there. We've left London after six, seven years of working there and moved out into the home counties. And um, so, so yes, yeah, so we uh, we arrived um, in Bury St Edmunds seven years later after we'd um, worked in a similar size place in uh, in Hartford, in Hertfordshire. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and yeah, we'd never been to Bury St Edmunds before and we just saw the the opportunity and that's what we bought, really. We mm-hmm. thought this building has got everything that we think that would suit our style of food. Mm-hmm. The town itself would benefit from a business that we had in mind that we would put in here. Mm-hmm. And also we were very, very drawn to the local area as well because, mm-hmm. you know, the abundant the abundance of great produce that Suffolk offers on its doorstep, you know, the, the larder that Suffolk offers mm-hmm. is just uh, some of the best quality best range and best sort of um, diversity mm. of produce that I think anywhere in England would struggle to match. So we were sold on it very, very mm. quickly. So, yeah, and, you know, like I say, we're in our 12th year now. It's hard to think that it was actually 12 years ago that it, that it actually happened, but uh, <laughs> but it's been a great time. It's been an absolutely fantastic time. We've done very, very well. Mm-hmm. We've uh, made a good name for ourselves. Mm. And I uh, don't know if I can handle 12 more years, but um, we've got no <laughs> real plans at the minute to uh, to move on or do anything drastic. So um, hopefully we're here for a wee while yet. You said about the building. The building is beautiful where Pea Porridge is based and it fits with your concept. Can you tell us a little bit about the concept of of your restaurant? Well, yeah, you're right. The building is a a nice old sort of end of terrace sort of building. It dates back to the uh, early 19th century. Mm. And uh, the building itself was once two cottages. So there's lots of exposed brick and lots of exposed beams. Mm. But also it's it's got a fantastic feature in it because once upon a time, before it became a restaurant, it was actually a working bakery. This ceased to trade in the late 70s and it became a restaurant thereafter. The old bread oven, the old baker's oven is still intact i mean we don't use it now we use a slightly more modern appliance but uh, to bake (laughs) our bread but the actual bread oven when you open the door it's about 12 foot deep so it's uh it's massive Mm. it's a wonderful feature it's in very good condition Mm. and uh well the thing is with things like that you can't buy those kind of features you know you try hard to make things look good Mm. but original features that have been built into the building and built into the walls just uh would would be sacrilege to take it out so so yeah so no and and going and moving on to my food you know this whole rustic kind of feel that um Mm -hmm. the building has inside and outside in some respects it sort of really suited my whole ethos about food and what i've been doing building up to come into pea porridge and what i've been doing since i've been here as well we prefer a more sort of rustic sort of laid back a bit more sort of gutsy robust Mm -hmm. kind of approach to our food yeah so bold butch flavors in the winter but you know we're we're not sort of impartial to the odd uh delicate uh touch as well yeah but um Mm -hmm. but no we um like i said we've the community and the in the sort of suffolk surroundings and the countryside and the farming community that's all around us here received us really well. We championed in the early days, and we still do, 
more of the unusual cuts that you perhaps wouldn't find in other maybe restaurants in the area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're utilizing a lot of offal, you know, things like sweetbreads, things like tongues, things like hearts, ears, even brains mm. um, sometimes. But we run that alongside our more regular staples. So there's something for the simpler palate as well. Mm -hmm. So that rustic approach in going directly to farmers, et cetera, buying our produce from them, you know, they were welcomed us to the community because a lot of these uh, farmers, butchers, uh, breeders and things don't really have homes for the offal and things like that. Mm. A lot of chefs out there don't really understand it, don't really know how to utilize it mm-hmm. properly. It is a labor of love. If it's in the right hands, it can be handled and mm. it can be handled well. It's just as good as any other prime cut and any of the primals. Mm. And um, and yeah, I mean, if people say, oh, I'd never eat heart or things like that. Well, I'm sorry, you are eating heart because <laughs> 90% of heart meat goes into hamburger production. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get rid of all the nasty bits, all the tubes, all the entrails, and things like that, and you cook it nice and properly, let's mm. say it's as good as it's as good as a fillet of beef. Mm. An ox heart is as good as a fillet of beef. So we try and champion those things. We utilise everything we can, mm-hmm. and uh, that kind of whole ethos and the food that we have fits in with the character of the building as well. Mm. It's a cosy, homely, rustic, warm environment that Pea mm. Porridge has. So, so yeah, we pride ourselves on that. And the open fireplace as well adds adds to that too so um so yeah we love it we love we love the atmosphere we love the style of hospitality that we give here Mm -hmm. and um our regulars do as well so uh so yeah hopefully they will do for many years to come (laughs) i'm sure they will i was gonna say your restaurant isn't unusual it's just different in a fabulous way because when you're talking about offal there it's fading out and yet offal can be the most tastiest meat doesn't it provide more flavor than regular cuts sometimes absolutely i would say so and you know you know, there's there's more of a skill to cooking it properly, like I just mentioned. Mm. It's kind of easy to cook a fillet of beef or a rack of lamb or like a loin of pork or something like that. Mm. But there is more skill in trying to make these sort of underused cuts shine. Mm. And I think that me and my team have a have a strong love of you know that kind of product. Yeah. And um, we you know we we focus on it. We research it. We play with it. Yeah. Like you said, it is under it is underused and we're flying the flag and mm. you know, and not we're not alone, but we're trying to fly the flag to get people to eat more of it. Mm. Let's say. And game and game and things like that as well. Not only awful. Mm. You know, we've tried to use the bounty of the county, I like to call it. So <laughs> you know there's it. so much game and things around here that we need to start eating more of mm. that as a nation to fair instead of shipping it off abroad and Absolutely. You know, it to other countries. I know you, you have a, a fabulous kitchen, but who's Bertha? What is Bertha? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's good that you mentioned that. About six years ago, we decided, OK, we need to sort of try and change the way that we work and try and um, limit the amount of uh, gas and energy that we use and things like that. So Bertha is effectively an indoor barbecue. It's run on charcoal and wood and... Um, it can reach temperatures of 500 degrees. It's a real furnace inside. Mm. It looks almost like a massive safe, but it's fantastically insulated. So it keeps the heat within. Mm. So you can get down and dirty with the coals. And we do all sorts of things on 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 the Bertha. You know, it's it's so versatile. Yeah, it's so uh, it's so unique, and it lends itself to lots of different styles of cooking. Mm. For fast, high heat cooking, yeah, that's the order of the day during during service times when you've got the when you've got the coals roaring hot, white mm. hot, and um, yeah, we use it at that heat during the uh, during the service. But after service is complete, you know, we can spread the coals out. We can take some coals out over the embers. One of my favourite dishes that I do is is throw some leeks on top of the burning embers, and once they're black and charcoal all the way around, we take them out. And you might look at it and you think, well, what are you going to do with that? It just looks <laughs> it looks like a lump of stick of coal. But no, and you peel back the membranes and it's the leak. Yeah. And it just reveals a lovely, soft, beautiful, smoky piece of uh, piece of green veg. And yeah. it is just a joy to eat. Um, but using it for slow cooking overnight as well. I mean, I've, I, there's no end of things you can do. Scallops in the shell, slow braises, um, sear, searing on there with yep. um, wood just to get that smoke on before you braise. I've even cooked uh, rice in there, cooking fruit on there, yeah. searing fruit, you know, things like pineapples and things like that tend to take on that, that smokiness really, really nicely. Mm. It, it, there's no end of things I could do. It's it's a, it's an integral part of the kitchen and uh, there's no way I could imagine being without it. In fact, to an extent that I bought a second one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I can't, well, that's 
strictly not true. <laughs> I didn't buy a Bertha. I bought uh, something similar called a Grizzly. It's a very, very similar to a Bertha, but it's much, much smaller. Mm-hmm. And I tell a white lie again because I didn't actually buy it. The owners of Grizzly contacted me, saw what we were doing on Bertha and thought, hmm, could you utilize a Grizzly to go alongside your Bertha? And I was like, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Um, but what's the cost? And they were like, no, no cost. We just want to give it to you. Do a little bit of social media things for us and things like that. And we'll wow. be happy. Yeah. Um, so they're just trying to launch this product as well. So it's Grizzly Charcoal Oven. We work that alongside the Bertha. Uh-huh. And uh, both things are absolutely amazing. They're fantastic uh-huh. bits of kit. And uh, like I say, I couldn't imagine working in a kitchen without them now. They're so integral. Grizzly sounds more yeah. um, containable and easy to handle. Is it strictly a commercial piece of equipment or could you use it in a normal no, kitchen? No, you're right to mention that. That's absolutely true. It is smaller. It's uh, it's less robust, let's say, but it comes at a fraction of the price. I would suggest no. I wouldn't use any of these things in your kitchens at home because generally you're in, your extraction systems at home wouldn't be able to cope with it. Mm-hmm. But they're not really designed for that domestic use. Mm. Domestic use, yes, but in your garden. Sure. Um, and a grizzly would, or a Bertha for that matter, would look fantastic in anybody's patio mm. uh, garden. A real um, showpiece. They, I think they've taken over from things like Big Green Eggs and Komodo Joes and things like that. Right. Is the must-have yeah. uh, essential in uh, in people's gardens. And I think with the summer and, uh, and the year we've been through, yeah. more and more people have had no choice but to cook at home. And uh, this yeah. just mixes things up nicely. And uh, it's a nice alternative yeah. to uh, slogging away on the stove. So yeah. Sorry, Mark's nice just showing me a nice photograph there, yeah. of a grizzly. It's like half okay. an arga, but with warming drawers and everything. It's clever. It looks really. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so many uh, different things you can do with it, um, and I've only just scratched the surface. I've only had it. I've only had it a couple of months, right. so we're coming to grips with it ourselves and um, and trying different things all the time. So. Uh, so yeah, but one of the things that it does, it, it, it is great for, is cooking our uh, sourdough flatbreads. We make flatbreads and it works fantastic over a, uh, on a stone over the coals in the grizzly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, heat cir- the heat circulates so well inside it. Mm. And because it's so well insulated, they take seconds to cook. Brilliant. And um, they've been such a stir since we... Uh, since we reopened after um, the summer. Walk. Well, we so, were just um, coming to that, aren't so, yeah. we? Talking about the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It must have been such a shock for you guys. Well, for everybody in hospitality. Well, it was, yeah. I mean, I um, I think we all could see something coming with uh, what was happening uh, with our uh, European cousins in Italy and Spain mm. and things like that. And I, I think there was probably an element of disbelief that it would ever come here, you know. But I think that it was, it was inevitable uh, in the end. And um, I, I was sitting in a, I was in a golf club, actually. I've just finished around the golf when Boris made his announcement to say avoid restaurants and then two days later he said um, do not go to them close sort of mm. thing so yeah it was a massive shock to the system obviously the, your initial thought is what about all my stock what am I going to do with that what, what am I going to do and of course, how yeah. can I afford how can I how can I live how, what's going to go but initially it was the fear factor more than anything else looking back on it now you think mm, maybe I was a bit you know overzealous but people were scared to go out to their bins to put their bins out you mm. know they didn't realise how dangerous or how serious this could be mm. and um, you know we later learned that you know keeping your distance will help you and things like that and do the precautions things like that but um, but yeah no it was devastating to any business and that you know but yeah, yeah yeah, we got a little bit of support from the government and stuff, but not really enough, to be fair. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite in a fortunate position that I do own the building that I occupy and I live upstairs as well. So um, my overhead's fairly sort of low. There's no mm. no sort of landlord knocking at the door. No. But, um, but yeah, my priority was just to make sure that my staff were all uh, looked after throughout the furlough scheme and things yeah. like that. And, um, you know, we, we sort of declined to do any takeaways in that initially because we, um, we felt that, you know, it was something that we didn't understand. Mm. And we felt that being in a major sized town, that it's already well sort of serviced with those kind of mm-hmm. um, establishments, you know. And one, we didn't want to perhaps um, take business away from them and they needed it as well. We all um, took the time off and tried to ride it out sort of thing. And then things eased up a bit. So the golf course was open. So it wasn't too bad. <laughs> the, weather was, the weather was good. And during that time, I did a lot of, um, a lot of social media things as well. And mm-hmm. one of the things I've done was uh, to challenge um, fellow chefs through Instagram mm-hmm. on a live feed on Instagram to do something that we called Ready Steady Cook just as a homage to the, to the TV show yeah, the, yeah. the, the 20 minute challenge so um, <laughs> so we get a mystery mystery box uh, supplied by uh 
our um, our suppliers. Mm-hmm. One week it would be fish fish oriented, the next week it would be meat oriented, the next week it would be um, vegetable oriented. So, so yeah, and we'd uh, and I'd invite a, a, a local chef that um, we I was friendly with, and uh, we'd have a little challenge, and we get. Um, everybody to who was viewing to vote at the end kind of yeah. thing but it was more of a laugh more than anything else you know and uh-huh. a good chance to catch up with uh, your pals in the trade and stuff and yeah. uh, and uh, not take it too seriously you know, yeah. just, you know <laughs> watching a tv show through uh through a, a mobile phone is not always <laughs> the easiest but uh, we made the most of it and uh, and people enjoyed it so we did about half a dozen of them uh, yeah. once a week yeah. but chefs are slightly competitive aren't they well we are a competitive bunch but i think we're more competitive against ourselves yeah. than each other i think that you know, especially around here, we I get on very well with all the all the chefs who work in the sort of independence and things, and we mm-hmm. all sort of rub off one another. We meet each other now and again, whether it be for a coffee or a beer when the pubs are open, or just have a wander around the park mm-hmm. and have a catch up and, and uh, have a whinge and a moan, even you know, and engage each other's thoughts and pick each other's brains. So we all we're, we're, there's a good sort of rapport amongst the uh, amongst the local chefs. That's and, really good to and, hear. Now, Justin, you've written a poem. I did. That no. was another thing that I'd done during lockdown. Um, it, it was something that I worked out for about two, two and a half months. I'd just done a little bit, mm-hmm. put it down, picked it up again, put it down. And uh, yeah, it was all sort of related to the uh, to the pandemic. And obviously being in the hospitality industry myself, okay, many other industries suffered, but obviously it's the industry I'm in. So I, I wrote a little poem sort of regarding um, not just my business, but mm. I think other restaurants or businesses within hospitality could uh, understand where it was coming from and probably touch them as well yeah so um so yeah that would was, you uh, that could was you fun. read it now what the poem <laughs> <laughs> i can if you'd like me to yeah i, I certainly would well, i think so you've mentioned it or i've mentioned it sorry i will but um we we also uh, we also put music to it as well and we've done like a like a techno version of it as well so uh, that's available for people to watch <laughs> if they dig deep into the uh YouTube or something like that. I don't. I can't remember. What no, I tell you, even uh, better. Send the, us the MP3 and we'll think, play it at the end of this podcast. <laughs> okay, but I think the the uh, a cappella vocal version is the best, okay. and uh, <laughs> and I will read it out if you. I will read it out to you if you like. Yeah, and I'm going to stand up for this. Good. So, <laughs> Exciting. I need to give it because I need to give it some gusto when I okay. do it. So right. uh, so we called it Ode to a Thriving Bistro. So. Um, Here it goes. Mm -hmm. Pea porridge, sunrise, birds sing, sleepy eyes. Ruffle hair, creep downstairs. Bertha lit, coals spit. Kitchens awake, no tea break. Pots steaming, lobsters screaming. Telephone rings, more bookings. Tables waiting, staff anticipating. Busy service, getting nervous. Diners delighted, all united. Tempting aromas, mmm, just like mamas. Sweetbreads popular, sharing plates spectacular. Snails and bone marrow, mmm, maybe tomorrow. Lovely beef cheeks, ash roasted leeks, mutton tagine, chocolate praline, and tart tatan, the ultimatum. Focaccia, a real big hit. Run out and we're in the bleep. Phew, <laughs> service complete. Now time to retreat. Pea porridge, sunrise, birds sing, sleepy eyes. Phone doesn't ring, we can't do a thing. No reservations, pure devastation. Kitchen cupboards bare seems so unfair. Stare out the window. We need more info. Customers, where have you been? Oh, yes. Lockdown for COVID-19. Hopefully, diners return a plenty. Damn you, coronavirus 2020. And that's the ode to a thriving beast. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, we did. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you for reading that. That was really, really good. Very. Um, no, you're welcome. Uh, very Enjoyed doing it. Hitting, actually. I can't think of the right word, but that that'll do for now. A lot of response to that, and um, it, it was good fun writing, and and, um, mm. and I, I I don't know, maybe it's 
the uh, poets of the world would think, oh, that's not very great. that's not very good. There's room for improvement. But I uh, think I've discovered a talent that I maybe never had before. So. Well, we think <laughs> so, it's a talent. So it's it's definitely at- there. Um, humorous too, and I liked it very much. I thought, and uh, poetry is, is about expression. There you go. Thank you. Mm. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. We did. <laughs> And uh, and how do we follow that? I tell you how we follow that with your humorous but brilliant get my goat campaign. Tell us about that because I loved that. Yeah, well, when we reopened in July after the first um, after the first lockdown, mm-hmm. um, I rejoined forces with an old sparring partner of mine who um, who worked with me for years, and he left and uh, went on to make a big name for himself locally and uh, took up the helm at a few local kitchens and done really well, but. You know, the sort of the sort of pandemic sort of scuppered his plans moving forward as well. So we kind of teamed up again together and we reopened together with a different kind of slant on mm. the food that we were doing before. And we went down a slightly more Moorish influence. So um, we uh, utilised sort of dishes and ingredients and flavours from places like the Moorish influence countries like the Middle East, mm. Turkey, uh, North Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, even places like um, Sicily and uh, southern Spain and things like that. Mm-hmm. So and one of the things that I'd done when, I, when, I, when we opened again was to feature goat on the menu. Goat is something I've done sporadically over the years, mm-hmm. um, but it was something that really tends to the Moorish flavours. The mm-hmm. meat marries really well. We thought, okay, well, we kept this going. It was very, very popular. Numerous different cuts we used. We used, um, we used shanks. We used whole shoulders. We used mm-hmm. neck fillets. We used neck on the bone. Nice brazen cuts that would tend to marry themselves very well to the movie flavors and uh, work very well in tagines. When we were told that we had to lock down again, we thought, okay, we'd sat around for long enough in the in the sort of spring summer. Mm-hmm. We can't sit still anymore. One. Yeah, the, the weather's not as good as it was. It's darker. It's uh, colder. Yeah, we're just going to end up sitting upstairs watching TV, eating far too much, watching rubbish on telly, and drinking too much. Now, I still drink too much, but the uh, <laughs> the other two, the other two things we put aside. So, um, so yeah, we thought, well, why don't we come up with something that we can offer people to to hear at home, take away kind of thing? And we thought, goat. Nobody else is doing something that's related to goat, mm-hmm. not locally, but maybe not even nationally. I don't mm. know. Mm. But we thought, well, yeah, it might be a small market, but hopefully the market will be big enough for little old us. So we got our thinking caps together and we put a four course Moorish influenced uh, feast together and we called it Get My Goat. <laughs> So I think it's quite an apt name. And um, yeah, well, so we decided, right, we'll do these sardo flatbreads that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, that would that would do that to start. And then we made like a little sort of goat coffee, like a little goat coffee kebab that we mm-hmm. served with sort of thickened yogurt and things. Then we done a tagine with couscous and uh, other accompaniments. And then we done a Basque style cheesecake as, mm. a, as a dessert. And the cheesecake was made using goat's yogurt. Yeah. But the whole ethos behind this goat is um, is my supplier, who I've used for several years now, and they're called Cabrito Goat Meat. Mm-hmm. Now, the, first, the story behind that is fantastic because uh, the guy who uh, started the company up was a guy called James, James Wettler. He was a chef in some of the best restaurants in London, but he had an accident and that paid to his, uh, his um, kitchen career. So one thing led to another, and he uh, discovered um, goat meat. He was shocked to find out that all the dairy, the dairy farms, when they were given birth to dairy billies, obviously they're no, they're no use for the dairy, um, mm. dairy market. So they get euthanized at birth. Oh. So he thought, I've got to do something here. So what he done was he took on, he was given them, he, he just took the, all the dairy billies that they had and reared them, mm. gave them a quality of life, Gave them a quality of life that they would never have had before, yeah. and uh, reared them for the table, all organically, free range, and the product is absolutely outstanding. Mm. How this was, go- how this was allowed to go on, just, uh, just I can't fathom it. But anyway, he uh, started his business really slowly, delivering whole beasts himself, mm-hmm. and um, that, I would get through it. Uh, and that's whole that whole support started from there on and I've just watched him grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and he's had his products in all the best restaurants in London now he's been on a great British menu with these products he's really made a made a great name for himself and mm. uh it's all to do all to do with the story and the ethos of provenance and, mm. and and all that kind of stuff. So um so yeah, 
the get my goat thing was a roaring success to be fair i didn't know what to expect but it was so well received we sort of run out of our capacity every weekend mm. and all together over the we only done it over three weekends while we were locked down and uh, we done almost 500 uh, meals so wow. it was far more than i okay. anticipated mm. and we're delighted with the one the response and two the feedback incredible yeah people came back three, three weeks in a row uh. Three weeks in a row they came back, and I couldn't believe it. So, yeah, I mean, it was just for the same product. We didn't mix it, <laughs> no. mix it up at all. Yeah. It was yeah. the same meal. And yeah. um, we've, carried, we've carried it on since we've reopened, but obviously mm. demand has, uh, has gone down now that restaurants have reopened yeah. and uh, people want to go out a bit. So, yeah, so, no, the, um, we've, we're keeping it going. We've got quite a few booked in this weekend as well. We've sort of rejigged it this weekend. We're doing a slightly different cut. We're doing, like, uh, also buco with uh, goat shank this week so that's going to be a nice uh, a nice alternative to the tagine so um so yeah so now yeah. we're looking forward to people coming and getting that and enjoying their feedback hopefully yeah. so um so yeah get my goats we've got t-shirts made we've got some merchandise and mm. we've got books from written by the cabrito group founder mm. um that with some fantastic recipes in there and a, and a, and a, all things a to z and a to z involving goat also, they've also made um, goat soap made from all the excess fat that wow. uh, remains from the goats. Meat. Yeah. And they're absolutely beautiful. The fragrances are fantastic. There's two different uh, fragrances. We have them for sale uh, in the restaurant and signed copies mm. of the book as well. So lovely little Christmas uh, treat uh, to to, uh, yeah. to, uh, to uh, put in you, the bottom of your stocking or underneath your tree or something like yeah. that. So, yeah, excellent. So Definitely. we'll keep that going. <laughs> We've got some time left, a little, but okay. I don't want to leave wine yeah. out. We must talk about wine. Subject very close to my um, <laughs> to my lips. <laughs> but uh, but no, I've been pot, been potty about wine for uh, a long time now. It's mm -hmm. you know we take the wine list we take the wine list here at Pea Porridge really really seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the first thing I look at really when I go and eat out. I've, I don't look at the menu first. I look at the uh, the wine list because uh -huh. I think if a restaurant takes a wine list seriously, then I think they're going to take the food seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think they both have to be treated exactly the same. Our labour of love comes from sort of visiting, you know, vineyards, visiting the producers, travelling around and understanding the whole ethos of Altman's people. Mm -hmm. We're a small business. Mm -hmm. We only work with like-minded people who are small, independent and... You know, art, artisan. I don't really like that word, but I'll mm. use it artisanal. So, so yeah, and we only try to, well, I wouldn't say 100% of our list, but I'd say 90% of our list is all made up with low intervention, minimal sulfites, organic, biodynamic, natural wines with very, very little added mm. to the process of the winemaking uh, as possible. The amount of additives that are allowed in wine. It's scary. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you wouldn't believe it. If you go to the supermarket, you can flip over a, I don't know, a packet of sausages, and it can tell you everything that's inside them, or you know, any sort of food stuff. Yeah. But with wine, it doesn't tell you anything. You know, it only says contains sulfites. But you're allowed up to I think of 140 different additives into wine that's permitted. Oh my goodness. But we try to source wines that have got as close to zero as possible, mm. and. And yeah, it's 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 just a labour of love, and mm. um, and I think you can really tell the difference when you when you source wines that way. We don't use any one supplier; we use five or six different suppliers, but they have the same. Our suppliers have the same mental ethos as we do. Mm. They source from small, independent, not boutique, because that's because it's not what they are. These are hardworking individual mm. family-owned businesses who, you know, it's a lifeblood, and it has been for generations and generations. Mm. So. So yeah, it, it, it's it's a real pleasure for us to introduce these wines to people. We're not educating people about wine; we're just introducing to some, and, mm. we, can, and we can tell a story about it as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, Pea Porridge has got far and away the most comprehensive selection of natural wines in the whole of East Anglia, mm. and I think that we've, we're the only restaurant that really focuses on uh, skin contact wine as well, orange wines. And I don't know if you're familiar with them, but orange wines are effectively white wines that are made in the red wine process mm -hmm. so the fermentation process involves adding the skins to the ferment 
Normally right. with a white wine, you would squeeze the juice and discard the skins and then start fermenting. So you get that. That's mm. where you get the white from. Because the actual color of wine doesn't come from the juice. It comes from the actual skins. And that's where your red yeah. wine, the juice of a red grape isn't effectively red. It comes from the skin. Right. But using the skin contact method on white grapes, depending on the type of grape and how well they tend to the contact of the skin. And it varies from different uh, producer to producer what they want to actually achieve. Yeah. The best place in the world to, that produce these wines are northern Italy in the Friuli region mm. and Georgia as well. And Georgia is a real labour of love. So mm-hmm. we, uh, we've, we've always supported Georgian wine and Georgian producers. Uh, mm. Uh, ancient traditions in the wine list as well. Mm. Some people say, oh, well, it's a bit, all this natural wine, it's a little bit kind of, um, it's a little bit hip and trendy. And I suppose it is in some circles, but we often find that those producers that are making it for that reason are the ones to avoid. It's the ones that have always been doing it mm. and the ones that are passionately been doing it through the generations and and are, are not doing it alongside their other wines. This is all they do. This is why yeah. we do tend to focus our uh, attention to. Mm. Um, yeah, so no, if um, anybody out there is intrigued or curious, we uh, would love to be able to introduce those wines to you. Yeah, well said. <laughs> A quick mention about your team because they have been, well, highly dedicated to you throughout this process, of, throughout this last year, I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, not just through the, throughout the year. I yeah. think that um, over the over the years since we opened, we've been very fortunate to uh, attract really good staff. Mm. And it's been a pleasure for me to to nurture them and, uh, and work with them, educate them. I, I wouldn't say that, but to mm. pass on my knowledge, if you like, to see them, you know, do a year, do 18 months, two years, and then move on and better themselves somewhere mm. else. And I don't like denying progress, you know, mm. and I don't want people to be here forever. They have yeah. to move on and benefit their own careers. But I lo- do take great pride in seeing them, you know, get a great head chef's job when they leave here or eventually become a head chef of a great restaurant or a mm. great hotel. Or even in some respects, some people have gone on from here to open their own successful businesses as well. Mm. That gives me great pride as well. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I mean, recently over the last sort of year or so, yeah, we've kept it because of the amount of covers we've had to lose through social distancing measures and, uh, and the curfews and things like that. We've, we've lost quite a lot of cover. So it's inevitably meant that we've had to sort of cut back a little bit on our on our staffing as well. Mm. So, I mean, we didn't necessarily lay staff off. We just sort of, we, we mainly had just part-time staff at that time mm. anyway. And, uh, and we sort of still have them involved in some way or another, but they had other jobs as well and mm-hmm. things. So we, um, and uh, so we streamlined things a little bit to know what to work. Um, my great friend and colleague James came back to work with us, and um, and you know we are just a core sort of team at the minute. There's mm. three of us with a little bit of part time help. There's myself, and my wife Jurga, yeah. and also James, and we get stuck in and do everything. Whether that means you know cleaning tables, serving food, mm. the three of us uh, make it a real team effort. And mm. That's what people are such a success. It, it's been a great sort of summer, you know, the, the remainder of the summer when we reopened and mm. stuff like that. We had, a, we had a great time focusing on new flavors, constantly trying to find new ingredients and new sub, even new suppliers to an extent. And mm. we, we started working with a plastic fish supplier who, you know, is sourcing uh, boat, uh, from boats all up and down the length of the breadth of the country. And he had a vital link for us, which is uh, because of our ethos of sourcing local and seasonal and sustainable and things, mm. and from small producers, etc., and small um, craftsmen. From uh, Felix Soferi, our most local fish has landed to us. Mm. And we've been championing it for as much stuff from Felix to Ferry as we possibly can. So mm. we've been enjoying recipes with our friends over there from the small day boat, fishing boats and stuff like that. Mm. So that's been an, an enjoyable as well. So, um, so yeah, no, it's been a great time. And uh, hopefully um, for the next couple of weeks with Christmas approaching, we um, we can, you know, have a really good end to the year. Well, we do hope that you do. How do we book a table? Well, the best way, we don't have an online platform at the minute. It is something that we're working for and we'll mm-hmm. probably put in place in the new, new year. The best way to do it is just give us a call at okay. the restaurant. Um, you could send us an email and we could uh, we can respond uh, that way. Mm-hmm. But the best way is to the best way is to ring. So, um, so yeah, we've got okay. very very limited availability up until Christmas. But, uh-huh. um, but, um, but yeah, we, we might just get in there. Call, we will call. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, you might just get in there if you're if you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah, exactly. Are you closed over the between Christmas and New Year? We are actually. Yeah, we mm. always close. I know that it's been a bit of a stop start year, but we yep. do always close uh, for a break over Christmas and mm. New Year. Um, and as far as as such, we haven't really got a date that we're going to reopen yet. Mm-hmm. We're we're kind of just waiting to see how things pan out with the government sort of. Yeah. announcements and guidelines after Christmas and we normally wouldn't open for the second week in January and anyway so no, quite. we'll probably get Christmas out of the way and then we'll uh, make a decision on when That's we reopen it. and yeah. it'll give us a good time to take stock of things see where we are as a mm. as a business as a nation I suppose and we're really looking forward to the challenges that 2021 um, will, will throw at us mm-hmm. but we're uh, we're enthusiastic we're optimistic we're uh, full of energy and life but you know, but tucked away behind that, underneath it, there is a little bit of trepidation as to what uh, lies ahead. But uh, it's not going to let that stand in our way. We're going to no battle on with uh, with uh, full steam ahead. Yeah. Well, you're not alone. We're all together in this, quite frankly. So, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. and at least we have all we will have each other. Justin, thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely to Pleasure. talk to you. It's been really interesting to. Oh, you too. <laughs> you too, absolutely. No, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been great. Super. Well, Merry Christmas to you and Jurga and your family. Yeah, absolutely. And likewise to you and all the uh, Suffolk Pod Show listeners. And uh, Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Suffolk Pod Show. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can visit our website, podtalk.co.uk. And here's our disclaimer The Suffolk Pod Show will not be held responsible for any omissions or errors in its podcast. The Suffolk Pod Show is produced purely for entertainment purposes. Views and opinions are that of our own or that of our guests. 